Well, hello everyone. My name is Mauricio Carvalho, and um, today we're going to take a look at the history of racism. Yes, that's a um, very hot topic. There's a lot of um, misguided, incomplete, or overall false information circulating on the topic, and uh, but there's a lot of discussion and interest on exactly what is not only racism itself, not only not only the the, 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 the ideas that certain races are different or better than others or um, but the concepts of race, how people throughout history have conceived, have understood, have quantified and qualified the physical differences that exist uh, between the, the perceived phenotypical differences that exist between the various uh, human populations. Um, of course, this topic may be highly demonetized, and um, as I make this video, I don't know if the video will itself be even allowed on YouTube or monetized at all. So if, I, if you want to contribute to the channel, take a look at the description, find ways to contribute to my effort here to make a, a channel on linguistics and also on history and, uh, and uh, human populations and diversity and cultures. But, um, well, let's go to the... Uh, earliest, um, I would like to start with the earliest um, known, as far as I could determine in my research, the earliest um, registry, the, ear the earliest register, the earliest records um, describing physical differences between human beings. Those are ancient Egyptians, ancient Egyptian texts and illustrations, such as the one you see are right there where the different uh, skin colors and physical features of pop populations known to ancient Egyptians, uh, what they looked like, and uh, they're, they're portrayed as the multiple, I don't know if they called it races, okay, many people refuse actually nowadays to use the word race, saying that there's only one human race, but that's mostly, <laughs> that's mostly nonsense, okay, any variation within a species can be within biology described as different races, okay, as long as these differences are actually genetically motivated. So, of course, uh, mere skin color is not race itself. There's also phenotypical differences in the shapes of the bones, the nose, the eye sockets, the skull, certain parts of the body. There are different between several populations. Of course, human beings have been migrating throughout the planet for at least 70,000 years, and of course, these different populations that settle different continents and different areas have evolved slightly different features. So there are, of course, certain racial differences. Okay, pardon those who dislike the term race, but yes, race, maybe phenotype would be a more accurate, more interesting concept to work with, which is slightly different than that from race. But uh, yes, we can talk about phenotypes or races of, of human, uh, if you know, there is no clear border in many cases, between exactly where one race ends and another begins. So let's go back to ancient Egypt here. We see that uh, the first uh, character there to the left, which is actually a, a purely, a, apparent, appears to be the, 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 the whitest, the, the most uh, bright skin, light skinned, is actually the North African, the Berbers, who inhabited Libya, the Libyan desert, which is... Uh, the, the, the great desert, uh, of course, that we know as Sahara today, before the Arabs ran over the, 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 the region and took over North Africa. Uh, all of North Africa, um, west of Egypt, all the way to Morocco, was inhabited by Berbers, with a few uh, interferences from the Phoenicians, who, who uh, settled uh, uh, what is now Tunisia in antiquity and established the colony of Carthage. The Phoenicians were Canaanites. So they were, they spoke a language related to Hebrew. And um, Carthage, however, was destroyed by Rome, conquered by Rome, even though the language, the, the Phoenician language seems to have survived in Northern Africa for, for a while after, after. but um, you see how the North Africans were very fair skinned, actually more, I'm sorry, I don't like the term fair skinned, as if there's an unfair skinned uh, people, but person, but uh, light skinned, like white skinned. And the Egyptians are portrayed to the right there. Uh, the, the Egyptians are portrayed, as, portrayed themselves as brown, which is interesting in the light of, especially North American black 
community uh, claims that ancient Egyptians were black like they are, like this, the, the sub-Saharan black people are. The sub-Saharan blacks are portrayed here in the second position, right next to the second uh, left position, the, the, the dark-skinned guy. That is what the Egyptians knew as the Nubians, or the Sudanese, those who lived south of Egypt as you go up the Nile, the, the river Nile, you um, reach the dark-skinned populations that the Egyptians knew perfectly aware they existed. They were mostly called Nubians. There's also mentions of the land of Put, which is what's, what is now northern Somalia. And those uh, kingdoms who were actually very sophisticated according to Egyptian, uh, Egyptian records, uh, they were inhabited mostly by very dark-skinned uh, Sub-Saharan African peoples related to modern, I don't know if Ethiopians or uh, Somalis or Bantu people, but they were there probably. Uh, the, this picture that I'm showing there, this, this illustration was drawn about 35 centuries ago, I, I think about 32 centuries ago, that was way before the Bantu expansion. So when the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptian civilization was building the pyramids and drawing such drawings between 4,000 and 500 years ago and about two, about 1500 years ago when ancient Egypt existed as a, as a, existed as a fully independent nation, uh, Africa was quite different from as well as Europe. Europe was still being run over by the Indo-European tribes. Only the Basques, as we know, survived linguistically that expansion. And Africa hadn't suffered the Bantu expansion, which only happened about 2000 years ago when Egypt was a part of the, the, the Roman Empire. Um, so the, the Bantu expansion hadn't, hadn't taken over yet. The, the Bantu expansion over uh, 2000 to about 1500 years ago expanded throughout Central and Southern Africa, everything that is south of the equator, and ran over all ethnicities and languages that might have existed there before, we don't know exactly, including the Pygmies and the Khoisan, uh, of the Kalahari Desert, the Kalahari Desert in Namibia and South Africa and Botswana, which survived. The, the Khoisan preserved the languages, the, the Bushmen of the Kalahari. The, the Pygmies lost their language. There must, have been, there must have been several other peoples that existed throughout Southern Africa and Central and Southern Africa. They were run over by the Bantu, but I digress. Let's go back to the Egyptian um, concept of race that we see here, the phenotypical differences. We see um, the third figure from the left is uh, the Asian, that is supposed to be a Mesopotamian, like an Iraqi, a Babylonian, an Akkadian, or maybe a Sumerian figure, mm -hmm. Inha typical inhabitant, uh, inhabitant of what is now Iraq and Kuwait. Mesopotamia was a great rival civilization to Egypt in those days, the two big civilization, sophisticated civilization endowed with an abundantly used writing system and a centralized government and millions of inhabitants, those were the Mesopotamian kingdoms, first Sumeria and then Akkadian, the Akkadians, and of course the Egyptians. Um, so the Mesopotamians are portrayed as very fair skinned, I'm sorry, light skinned as well. And um, the Egyptians, as we see, is sort of in between. They're sort of brown, brownish, even though evidence points that that was very diverse. Egypt had a population that went from uh, more light-skinned all the way to very dark-skinned because several black people migrated north of the Red Sea and the Nile. So that's one of the first conceptions. But uh, as far as we know, the Egyptians didn't uh, conceive these, difference, uh, these, these differences as anything that made uh, each population better or worse than, something, than someone else. So when people say that racism is a modern construct, there's a certain truth to it, is that uh, the idea that people were biologically more capable of whatever, um, physical achievements or mental achievements or musical or sports or mathematical or geometrical or artistic achievements, this idea didn't seem to exist in humanity until indeed modern science and modern biology started conceiving of human beings as biological entities that are designed by genes and uh, something uh, more physical. People thought of humans in the past as some kind of a 
intermediate between an animal and a god, a divine animal that had a divine spark of intelligence and a soul, but had the physical weaknesses and imperfections of an animal. But our, our mind, our intelligence, was not seen as a product of biology. Most of, in most, for the most part, so biological differences between human populations were not actually something that people thought about all that much in the past. So, um, uh, as I said, uh, many black people in North America, um, a lot of the black populations in North America, they uh, conceive of the Egyptians as being black, uh, they, the, way they, the way they are. You can even see that in popular, uh, in pop culture elements from American culture, so that, that such as that old clip from Michael Jackson, uh, Remember the Time, with, uh, with uh, Eddie Murphy and Magic Johnson. But, um, of course, in reality, it must have looked like, more like modern Egyptians. And there's also been a recent controversy with a Netflix uh, documentary about Cleopatra, which showed Cleopatra as being a fully black, like sub-Saharan black type woman, which you can see right here, the actress that played the Cleopatra in that, uh, the, problem, the problem with Cleopatra is that Cleopatra wasn't even Egyptian actually, she was a descendant from the Greeks that ruled Egypt before Romans took over, she was the last the last queen of Egypt wasn't even Egyptian anymore. The Egyptians, the last independent Egyptian kingdom had existed uh, 500 years before Christ. Then Egypt was run over by the Persians. Uh, and then the Persian Empire was itself conquered by the Greeks. So the Greeks ruled over the Ptolemies, the Ptolemaic dynasty of Greeks. Ptolemy was um, a, a, a general of Alexander the Great. And he ended up ruling over Egypt after Alexander the Great died. And his, de his descendants kept on ruling Egypt. And several of uh, his uh, granddaughters and grand, 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 granddaughters were called Cleopatra. Cleopatra has existed in many, in many, for over many generations. I think that the famous Cleopatra was Cleopatra the Seventh, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but either way, she was descended from Greeks, and we have many actual depictions of Cleopatra that were made when Cleopatra was alive, showing her to be a classically Caucasian woman, no, no, no black features, as, as, as per the Greeks didn't, as far as we know, they didn't intermix all that much with the Egyptian population, so for the most part you can say that the ruling elite of Egypt in those days were essentially Greek-looking, there would be like Southern European Mediterranean peoples that vary between the Mediterranean type and some Alpine type. But to move, uh, to move over, to move on to um, the, the idea of race and the, the reality of race and the conceptions of race, we have to understand uh, the modern understanding of race, which comes from mostly uh, modern genetics and genome studies that stem from, started in the 90s, the 1990s. Uh, such as the, the famous Cavalli Sforza led human genome problem, uh, program that ended up uh, being summarized in the book The History of Geography and Human Genes, the geography of, uh, human, of human genes, where the various population were, the various human populations were genetically classified in trees. As you can see here, we have, um, you say, uh, the African. There is essentially an African stem, as you can say that the Bantu, the Pygmies, the Khoisan, the Ethiopians, and um, then there's a branch, there's everybody else. So yes, the, the African branch of humanity is the one that is most genetically distant from the others. Even the Australian Aborigines are closer to Europeans and Asians than they are to Africans, even though they look kind of black. They descend from populations that actually left Africa uh, tens, of thousands, uh, t tens of thousands of years ago. Uh, so the first branch, the first non-African branching is the one between the Australian and the New Guineans, who are of blackish complexion, and the non-Australians and non-New Guineans. That's mostly the Asians and Europeans. So we have the... 
the Indian Europeans and um, the, uh, as you see, the Laps, there are the Sami populations of northern, northern Scandinavian. In the, uh, represented in the pink area in the map, the mostly Asian types of the Samoyed that are natives to Siberia, the Mongol, Tibetan, Tibetan, Korean, Japanese, the Ainu, who are very different. The Ainu were Caucasian looking people who lived in Japan before the Japanese moved in. So the modern Ainu maybe have been inter interbred with Japanese people, there, but the ancient Ainu were very, very distinct. And they probably form a very different branch of of those Asians there. They're probably closer to the Indo-European and uh, Uralian types, but uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, the Chukchi, the South, and, the, and then the, Amer the Amerines. The Amerines are Asians. The American Indians, the, the First Nations of the New World, of the Americas, they are descended, of course, from Northern Siberian Asians who migrated to America about 12,000 years ago. Um, and then there is a Southeast Asian type Represented there in um, I don't know what color there is uh, right there um, Indonesian Philippines Malaysians Polynesians Micronesians and Melanesians those are the various Malayo Polynesian tribes of uh, the Malaysian archipelago and Polynesia so that's uh, the main branches of humanity as interpreted genetically by genetic but those genetic trees are not they're not they're not perfect because human branches Human populations didn't, didn't just branch off from a common source and then kept separate. As they branched off, many of those branches found each other together and interbred, continued interbreeding and meeting each other to a certain degree over the various migrations that zigzagged all over, especially Asia, Africa, North Africa, Europe, that had a lot of uh, peoples all over the millennia cir circulating around the continents and uh, running into each other and then interbreeding and exchanging genes throughout the millennia. So these, these beautiful branching schemes of humanity, as if branches are splendidly isolated from each other, from, from some kind of a pure ancestry scheme, that's uh, a little misleading. A lot of interbreeding, a lot of reconnection exists, a lot of um, a racial and ethnic and phenotypical mixture ends up inevitably happens as people migrate and re-migrate all over the world and of course before our fully human human homo sapiens sapiens uh, race ruled the earth there were other humans there were the, the neanderthals and the uh, another culture from uh, neanderthal type uh, populations in found not only, not only in Europe but also throughout Central Asia Northern Asia and those were li largely wiped out, even though there has been also some interbreeding. As humanity uh, left Africa 75,000 years ago, they probably interbred with the Neanderthals that they found throughout Asia and Europe. So essentially, if you continue in antiquity then, after the Egyptians, who lived right between the Middle East, the Middle East Europe, and Africa, um, had those... Um, uh, ideas about race. I don't know exactly what the ideas were, but they did understand physical differences. We go into the Roman and Greek times, and the Romans and the Greeks were famous for the notion of barbarians, especially their interactions with the other Europeans who were seen as barbarians. Uh, the Greeks saw the Greeks and the Romans were more like uh, more, uh, more typically a little bit darker skinned than the Northern Europeans would see blonde hair and blue eyes and green eyes as um, strange barbaric features. Even though there is also uh, uh, records of uh, especially women being um, attracted to the blonde hair. This is a lot of affair of, <laughs> that people have, not only women, but men especially have to blonde women may have had its roots back in Roman and Greek days when uh, some uh, Germans and Celtic peoples and Slavic people were, were enslaved by the Romans and the Greeks. And some of the women were kept captive uh, uh, in order to provide the hair, to make uh, blonde wigs for the, the, the Greek and the Roman women. There's some register, there's some there are a few records uh, mentioning that uh, particular development. 
But uh, the Northern Europeans were seen as barbaric and capable of understanding civilization. The Romans would go over to Germany and try to teach them about law and about aqueducts and writing systems and poetry. And, and then they left. And when they came back a few years later, the Germans had forgotten all about it. And they were beating on the drums and hunting with the, the bow and arrows. So they're pretty much the idea of, of Germans and Celtics and those Northern European blondes races um, were not, those ideas were not very positive, actually. But, uh, and actually, Northern Europeans uh, only took over the, the, the leading edge of civilization for the past well, two, 200 years, 300 years, until, until about, what, 1600. The, even European civilization was mostly centered around Italy, and the wealthiest nations in Europe were the, the, the Portuguese and the, the the Spaniards with their vast uh, overseas empires and the, their discoveries, whereas the Portuguese and the Spanish would open up, of course, the world to European navigations back in the four, late 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. And then the British and the French just walked down their steps and uh, took over as the leading civilizations, but that, that was a little bit late in, in, in human history. So, um, and then we have of course, the conception of race uh, that we see today. Um, well, around the 1700s, Europeans had navigated throughout the globe and they had uh, started making up drawings and uh, encyclopedias uh, registering uh, the various types of uh, human populations that they found across the, wor the world. Until the 1700s, there were no encyclopedias. Nobody knew anything. And there were no drawings or illustrations. So people didn't actually see even a drawing of other, other peoples around the world. When the first illustrations and descriptions started being assembled into encyclopedias, that people could see that there were different, uh, people were biologically different somehow, the, 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 the physical type or, or diff was different. And um, we have in the 1700s, we have Lideus, the Swedish biologist, uh, classifying species into clades and kingdoms and, and branches. And then human beings were also classified as, and then that, that's when the, the, the idea that some people were biologically more advanced than others started appearing. And then in the 1850s, of course, by the late 1800s, we had the theory of evolution also compounding into that, even though the theory of evolution is a, of course, a widely confirmed, universally confirmed, beyond any reasonable doubt theory, uh, it is uh, also a basis for a thinking that led into uh, multiple races claiming to be biologically superior, more evolved. But that's not the theory of evolution. So you don't say you evolve into a better thing. You can evolve into a stupid thing. Okay, the, the, the moles, those mammals who are blind and live in caves, they are very stupid and they evolved from more, from more intelligent mammals that existed before. So yes, you can evolve into a dumber. Evolving doesn't mean getting more intelligent. Evolving means just changing, adapting to the environment. If going into a hole, becoming blind and stupid and reproducing get, leads you to reproducing more, that, that evolution will take you down that way. It, it, it's even possible that uh, past populations had a higher mental capacity than modern population, at least in certain areas. Some people said that the, the, the Neanderthals might have been more intelligent than us, even though I don't know exactly what that would mean. <laughs> what kind of intelligence? Intelligence is a very difficult, difficult concept to, to, to work with. And human intelligence, of course, is the most complex phenomenon known in the universe that we know of. It's our own mind. It's our own understanding. How can we comprehend our own existence and comprehend the universe? You know, why only we have that capacity while animals don't, as far as we know. But that's a different discussion, I'm not even delving into the nature of human consciousness. But um, so we have in the 1700s, for example, Benjamin Franklin, before he, uh, the American independence, was writing on, uh, for example, his idea of Germans. The Germans weren't actually white. Germany at the time was very poor. German was exporting, beginning to export massive amounts of poverty to the United States as well as to 
uh, Brazil and uh, Argentina and other places in the world. Um, Germany, Central Europe had mass a massive amount of extremely impoverished people that would migrate throughout the, the world, especially uh, in the 1800s. And uh, Benjamin Franklin saw as Germans as contaminated by Asiatic, uh, Iranian tribes and Scythians and uh, maybe Mongolic people who had invaded Central Europe throughout the Middle Ages, and therefore Germans weren't actually a properly white people as the Anglo-Saxons were, and the Scandinavians maybe. So Germans were uh, not, 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 not white. Then we have the creation of the white race. Until the 1700s, nobody thought of whites. Okay? Europeans saw themselves as Christians. And it was only at the time that there was also the religious idea that uh, the, the white appearance of Europeans was something that was more pleasant and more beautiful. And that Europeans had a, somewhat uh, achieved <laughs> that appearance because they were Christians, because they were followers of God. And they resorted to the, the famous biblical passage of the curse of Ham. Ham was the son of uh, Noah, who was um, accursed for having seen the nakedness of his, the, 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 of his father when drunk. I don't remember exactly what the biblical passage says. But the curse of Ham was seen as a mark that was bestowed upon Ham, the son of, of Noah, for having sinned. And the children of Ham, therefore, but the Bible mean, means that uh, as a way to curse the Canaanites. The Canaanites were the neighbors, the immediate ethnic neighbors to the Jews who made up the Phoenicians and other peoples of what is now Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. And they, those Canaanites, uh, when the Bible was written, were the main enemies, the, the, the ancient Hebrew uh, culture was formed. The Canaanites, who are Semitic, actually, the, the, the Hebrew language is a form of Canaanites, okay? So, but the Hebrews didn't see themselves as Canaanites. They saw themselves as a separate ethnic, even though they spoke Canaanite. Hebrew is the Canaanite language. It's a form of Canaanite. So it's to Canaanite what Yiddish is to German. It's a Jewish Canaanite. But um, the curse of Ham was seen because Ham was, was given in the Bible as the ancestor of the Canaanites. The Jews had no intention of... A, of uh, uh, dismissing the, the blacks of Africa or anybody. The, the, the Jews couldn't care less about blacks. They probably didn't even, didn't even know all that much about the existence of blacks. And the little that they knew, the blacks had no interaction. The, 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 the black Africans had almost no impact on Jews. So the Jews weren't interested in uh, um, putting a curse on blacks. Whoever wrote the Bible, whoever wrote that, or created the story, his intention was to uh, say that God had put a, um, a curse on the skin of uh, the descendants of Ham, and that curse made the Canaanites. Like in the descendants of uh, modern Christians, however, have said that the Canaanites explained that by saying that the Canaanites had been migrants from Africa, who then went into Canaan and conquered the Jews uh, or. Uh, battled against the Jews. That's completely false. The Canaanites were native to the Middle East, had been there for at least 10,000 years. Their ancestors had been there forever, have nothing to do with black Africans. But modern Christians sometimes try to reconcile reality with the biblical story and with the tradition of, with the tradition of uh, this, uh, ascribing Ham to the ancestor of Africans. Uh, they try to creating a, a bunch of completely bogus stories, but um, the, 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 it was, it's funny that the Canaanite language is not described as a Hamitic language. Until the 1960s and 70s, there was a group of languages called Hamitic languages uh, related to the Semitic languages. The Semitic languages are Canaanite, Hebrew, which is the same, Phoenician, which is Canaanite, also, also the same, and the Mesopotamian languages that are related to Canaanite, and the Aramaic languages and the Arabic languages, the Arabic varieties. Because nobody could uh, describe Canaanite as anything but anything but Semitic. Canaanite is the same language as Hebrew, pretty much the same. So uh, the Canaanite language 
the, 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 the Hamitic group was ascribed to the Egyptians, the Berbers, and certain other uh, North African peoples. So uh, Egyptian was uh, classified as one of the Hamitic languages. Uh, the, 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 language are, the, the languages uh, languages that are related to Semitic, but not strictly Semitic. Um, but that's a whole other, <laughs> a completely different discussion on the on languages. Um, the truth is that indeed the, the 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 curse of Ham was indeed in the 16 1700s attributed in a completely delirious way to the blacks. The curse of Ham was the, the origin of the blacks. That's why the blacks had black skin, and that was seen as a curse as well. So. Um, that's uh, the religious beginning of race. Then there's the biological beginning of race, when races, when bi biological species started being classified, as I said, in the 1700s, and especially with the theory, the theory of evolution. The idea of classifying things was mixed up with the idea of thinking that one, one, one species or was more evolved and more, uh, more intelligent than the other. One variety, one race was more intelligent the other, than the others that blacks and Australian Aborigines had been uh, left in, a earlier, in an earlier stage of evolution. Therefore, they were not as intelligent as the Europeans and the Asians. Um, those ideas started flourishing between the, the 17 and 1800s. And also the discovery of the Indo-European languages, which were known as the Aryan languages, okay? In the late 1700s, in the 1780s, Onwards, Europeans traveling to India discovered that the old Indian languages, and later on they discovered that the old Persian language of the Persian Empire, you know, Cyrus the Great, Xerxes, Darius, all of those people in the North and Indians spoke languages that, that, languages that they described as Aryan languages. The Aryan. Aryan meant in these languages, in the old Sanskrit language of Northern India and in the old uh, Persian language and Median language of, of Iran, Aryan meant noble. Or, or lord, overlord, dominant. So Aryan meant they were, the Aryans were the dominant ethnic tribes of these regions in antiquity, about 3,000 years ago, and, and earlier, about 4,000 to about 2,000 years ago, there were the, the Aryan ethnicities that saw themselves as dominant in uh, most of uh, South Asia and, and Iran. Um, and linguists discovered that these languages were clear uh, uh, relative to the old European languages. Greek, Latin, Old Germanic, Old Slavic, Old Celtic. And they discovered, of course, that, that the populations that had the, those Aryans were from the same stock, linguistically stock, and probably racial as well, biological, as the, the peoples that conquered Europe. They had conquered Persia and India, and they had also sometime around uh, 4,000 years ago, conquered most of the European continent. Therefore, they created, well, we must be of the, 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 the Europeans are a Western expansion of the same Aryans that conquered Persia and India. So we are Aryans. So the idea of an Aryan race was created along the 1800s, as opposed to a Semitic race, which is the Middle Eastern white peoples and the Hamitic race of the Egyptians. So that's why Jews who are of Canaanite extract, Canaanite, linguistically Canaanite, uh, were classified among the Semitic peoples. That's why you say that anti-Semitism is hatred of the Jews, even though Semitic peoples are also the Arabs and the Ethiopians as well. So the Ethi Ethiopian languages, such as Amharic, which is the main literary language of Ethiopia with hundreds of years of history and its own writing system. The Ethiopians are Semitic and the, 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 the Eritreans as well. So if you say anti-Semitic from a strictly uh, anthropological and uh, linguistic point of view, uh, anti-Semitic is, uh, or Semitic, the word Semitic refers to Arabs, anybody who speaks a Semitic language, including the Maltese, the Maltese people, the island of Malta, which is a member of the of the European Union. The, the, the island of Malta is um, inhabited by people who speak Maltese, which is an offshoot of Arabic. So there's a, there, those are European Christian Semitics, Semitic people, Semites. Um, so the idea, the, 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 the label, anti, the, 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 
The concept of anti-Semitism anti as describing hatred of Jews is a very mistaken calling from a purely uh, scientific point of view is a very mistaken label. I wouldn't call, I say it's anti-Judaism, not anti-Semitic. Anti -Semitic. People saying that the Arabs are anti-Semitic <laughs> from a linguistics and uh, demographics and uh, uh, historical point of view, of course, it's just like saying that any if Italians have any prejudice against Colombians, the Italians are being anti-Latin. <laughs> the Italians are Latin. They're, they're more Latin than the Colombians. And uh, the, the, the Arabs, the Arabic-speaking peoples are linguistically Semitic, just as the Hebrews were. And nowadays, they, as they restored the Hebrew language, they are linguistically Semitic. We don't see much of our linguistic, uh, like a Semitic race, it's a little difficult to determine because there's low, overall Middle Eastern um, Middle Eastern genes that don't match exactly with the languages, but uh, especially because Arabic, the Arabic language was imposed over most of North Africa and the Middle East, over all ancient Aramaic and ancient Berber languages and ancient Egyptian. So mo most of the North African Semites are actually genetically descendants from the Egyptians and the Berbers. They were not the Arabs. So only partly because the Arabs invaded there, but the population still is overwhelmingly descended from the Berbers and the Egyptians. Um, so if you want to describe somebody who dislikes or hates uh, Jews, I would recommend using anti-Judaism anti or anti-Judaic, but the term anti-Semitic has caught on which is unfortunate because it's quite misleading, it's quite inaccurate. But um, uh, let's move on. But that, 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 that's the origin. You have to understand the origin of Aryan versus Semitic, that it was so important for the famous Nazi disgrace that befell Germany, the, the, the ideology that was partly based on the idea of an Aryan race, uh, being the master race of the world and the Semitic being sort of a parasitic, deficient race uh, of people, um, which is interesting because um, many people don't understand. But the Nazis had a lot of cons the idea of that, the idea that the Aryan race was present in Iran and India, was an interesting idea for the Nazis. But the Nazis and many European uh, racialists of the time of the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, they thought that the Aryans of Asia, the Aryans of Iran, especially India, had lost their race. They had uh, over interbreeding, because of interbreeding with local Asian populations, Semitic populations, and Dravidian populations of Southern India, and Mongolic and other various Asian races had, had uh, the, the Aryans of Asia had lost their Aryan blood and therefore, the Europeans were the only true Aryans. You know, that's about equally true. Probably uh, the, 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 the Indo-Europeans who migrated to Europe 4,000 years ago, they actually interbred with the local peoples. They are not purely, the, the Europeans are not purely descended from a Indo-European wave that practiced some kind of a genocide and killed the pre previously existing Europeans. We know that they intermingled and many of the racial features seen in, in especially Northern Europeans are um, derived from these older European uh, ethnic groups that existed there, blondness and so on. Those, those things probably evolved in Europe before the Europeans arrived there. They, they evolved as adaptations to an extremely um, cold climate away from sunlight and so on. But we don't know for sure. We can see when there is a fossil, we find uh, bones of people and fossils. We don't see hair, hair color. Maybe hair color we do see to a certain degree. But skin color, eye color, that's very difficult to determine. And then the Romans, as I said, the Romans and the Greeks had a concept of, um, of barbarians. Uh, which is wasn't exactly racial because if some barbarians were to marry Romans and uh, join a Roman family, they could become Romans. It wasn't like a they didn't think in biological terms back then, as I said. Uh, but of course, Romans and Greeks were not the only, the only uh, people who have distinctive uh, uh, classes. The Indians, 
as, as we all know, the Indians had the, the caste system until the, the 20th century, and even today in their, in their culture that, that still exists, precisely because India is a clash of Indo-Europeans, the Aryans of the past, and the, 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 the Dravidian peoples were the natives, and a bunch of other native peoples that existed there, and a bunch of other people who migrated there later. So India was a bit of a multiracial society for much of its history, much of its history. And those various layers of invaders have created overall a caste system to put people on different castes. And typically the top layer, the Brahmins, they tend to this day in India to be lighter skinned, to be more, uh, to be whiter than uh, the lower skinned, darker skinned, uh, the pariah, which are the, the, the bottom caste in India. But there's no clear relation with ethnicity or the, the relationship is only um, part, only indirect. There's no clear um, correspondence match between a skin color and caste. Those castes are more about social status and ancestry and we only reflect some kind of a racial, distinct, racial divide partly. And then we also have the East Asian racial concepts. Those are interesting. For example, when um, Japan started standing out as a great uh, East Asian superpower already in the late 1800s, in the 19th century, the Japanese started uh, creating their own concept of racial superiority. They said, they said that uh, the continental race people, China itself, had become racially inferior for the same reason that the Iranians and, and, and Indians had become from a European point of view, that they had interbred with invading Mongols and uh, barbaric tribes and other, they had degenerated their race. And the Japanese, therefore, because they were on an island, they were not invaded and therefore they were more racially pure and represented the East Asian race uh, more perfectly than the Chinese who had degenerated into a uh, deficient society. Because China was undergoing a lot of trouble at the time, China was China was only China was going to go through a, at least a century of very very bad situations, but that's another discussion. So it was up to the Japanese to free East Asia from European imperialism, and because the Japanese were the superior Asians, they were destined therefore to rule over all of East Asia, and they were doing the favor of colonizing, invading uh, China and, and, and Korea and uh, Southeast Asia and Indonesia in order to create one great Japanese Asian empire free from uh, European uh, intervention, but under their superior empire. That was the racial understanding of Japanese back in uh, those uh, 18, six, between the 1860s and the uh, 1940s. They had such ideas along with also some kind of spiritual ideas that existed as well religious ideas form one of the backbones of Japanese ideology in those days that, that made Japan actually successfully successfully uh, invade much of East Asia and uh, become a major player of course as we know in Second World War when Japan was a big match for the United States uh, which is pretty impressive actually uh, it's um, quite an achievement to be to be quite frank And then we have the modern conception of race, which the 20th century, and by the 20th century we have this highly um, established idea of a white race. Where does the white race come from? Uh, in the 19th century, was a German uh, anthropologist created the concept of a Caucasian race. But already, as I said, already Benjamin Franklin and the North Americans and British and several other European writers and thinkers already in the 1700s started to use the white race as a racial concept. But that was inextricably related to a concept of white superiority. I want to say white supremacy because that's a bit of a charged term. Uh, but the idea of, the, of as whites and, or Aryans, the, the term Aryans was, was only used a little bit later by the 1840s and so. But a white race, white idea, the, 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 the association of um, European uh, skin color, which is actually more like beige to rose to pink. Um, the idea of uh, Caucasians being of Western 
uh, Eurasians and Europeans that are being white is something that becomes quite strong by the 17 and 1800s. And in the 20th century, you get into the century pretty much with that concept unchallenged. unchallenged. The idea that there's a white race. But nobody can actually define what a white race is because there is no border between Europe and the Middle East and Russia and Asia and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Where, where exactly does the white race end? Where does it begin? There's a problem. Unlike Australian Aborigines who were in an island and were very strictly defined that everybody who was in the island was Australian Aborigine, everybody who wasn't Australian Aborigine wasn't. There's a very clear, clear boundary. The Caucasian race, which was created, as I said, by the German anthropologists uh, who for some reason thought that the people of the Caucasus, the Armenians, the Chechens, the Circassians, the Georgians, were the more um, the most typical, the most uh, perfect examples of the, of the West Eurasian phenotype that existed in Europe and, Middle, and, the, and the Middle East and North Africa, which is the, um, what most people perceive as white. But uh, overall, there's a migration to Nordic whiteness. The, the, the idea of Nordicism, Nordic whiteness, is the idea that Northern Europeans are the perfect, not the Caucasians, but the Northern Europeans, the Germans, the Scandinavians, the British, some of the French, the Dutch, were uh, maybe some Slavs even, were the perfect examples of whiteness because white, the, the concept of white, it means indeed related to a color. And the Northern Europeans are closer to being white in color. If you don't know, but no human being is actually white, even the albinos are not exactly white, but um, the concept of white then becomes the, 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 the lighter your skin tone, the more racially pure you are. And that was convenient for Northern Europeans as they started becoming the, more, the, more, the most advanced part of Europe in the 1700s and 1800s. They took over from Southern Europe and the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain, uh, the, the French Revolution, the the Enlightenment most, mostly happened in, in, even though Italy took a, uh, Italy was a huge player, of course, there, but uh, most, most of it ended up, ended up uh, you know, happening in Northern Europe. And um, so the concept of the white race, instead of Caucasian, uh, started taking over, especially in the United States, where a white race was, uh, Europe didn't have other races didn't have other populations. But the United States developed, and Latin America to a certain degree, certain, certain, certain parts of Latin America, had to develop a more, had to actually be, care more about race because several races, several human populations existed there in, in the Americas. So in the United States, the concept of a white race became extremely strong. And nobody could formally define what a white person was exactly. So, for example, if we go back just a little, we had um, uh, um, the, 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 the issue whether the Jewish people were white. Jew, were Jewish people really white? Because they were Semitic. They were not Aryans. Back then, in the 1800s, all the way to the 1930s and 40s, many people thought in the United States that Jewish people were not white. I considered them as non-white. The Italians weren't seen as non-white. The Southern Europeans, you know, the Greeks, the, the, the Italians, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, they were seen as not white, even though they were Europeans. But I don't know, they had some idea that uh, Southern Europeans had been contaminated with Arabic invasions during the Middle Ages and during the early modern time. It is true that Spain and Portugal and, of course, uh, Southern Italy fell under Muslim Arabic uh, colonization from much, more, many centuries, actually. And the Greek, the Greek were living under the Turkish Empire, the, the Ottoman Empire, for many, many centuries. And that gave Northern Europeans the excuse to exclude Southern Europeans from their beautiful little race. Um, but then, after the Second World War, suddenly people forgot about it, and the Italians and Greeks and Portuguese, uh, maybe uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish, but the Portuguese don't exist in the United States, okay? Nobody thinks... Nobody remembers that the Portuguese exist, and the Brazilians. The Portuguese and the Brazilians sort of, they are forgot, their existence is, for, is forgotten, and people just think of Hispanics. People think that everybody who lives in the Iberian Peninsula and, and uh, southern, anything south of the United States, 
you know, what's called Latin America, uh, is Hispanic. Um, of course, half of South America is Portuguese, but that's another discussion. And then as, as migration of, uh, of Latin Americans increased to the United States, they had to create this, 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 this uh, sort of a fourth or fifth race, because there were the, 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 the whites, the blacks, the Native Americans, the East Asians, of course, Chinese, and but then they had to create the, Lat the Hispanic, the Latino, the Latin race, which is a complete <laughs> insanity. But uh, they, they create, which is the funniest race of all. The, 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 the idea of Hispanics is completely absurd. The idea that there is a, a one single race inhabiting all the way from Mexico to Argentina is a, a profoundly idiotic conception. Uh, but until the, the 1980s, nobody thought, even in the United States, nobody thought about Latin Americans as belonging to a Latin American race, a, a Hispanic race. Uh, for example, we had TV shows in the United States, with, such as I Love Lucy. I Love Lucy had a, a Lucy Libol, the, 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 the actress, she was married to a Cuban guy. But the Cuban guy was a Cuban white guy, so that was not seen as multiracial. Um... We had uh, the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's in the 1960s with uh, Audrey Hepburn. And in the movie, she's engaged to a Brazilian farmer who is white. And of course, it's because he's white, he must be white. Not There was no interracial couple there. There was no interracial relationship. There's a white woman with a white man from Brazil. But um, with the increase in Mexican and Central American and uh, Latin American immigration, especially the poorer, the poorer layers of... Latin Americans, Latin Americans who are overwhelmingly non-white, or typically of indigenous or black, or a mixed race ancestry, the United States started seeing, and the world started seeing, of course, Latin America is essentially non-white. And in order to grant, like affirmative action or some other um, racial compensation systems in the United States, uh, everybody who comes from Latin America is seen as. Uh, non-white. So uh, you see absurdities such as uh, Antonio Banderas the other day, the famous Spanish actor. He's not even Latin American, he's actually from Europe, from Spain, from the original Spain. Uh, he won some kind of an award and all over social media people were praising the award. Oh my god, they were giving the award to this uh, minority person, a person of, uh, to a Hispanic person instead of giving to a white man. So Antonio Banderas is not white. People from Spain are not white. Uh, if they are not white, then the Spanish conquistadors were Hispanic. If the Spanish conquistadors were Hispanic, the genocide that they committed against the Aztecs and the, the various uh, Incas and other indigenous tribes, so the genocide that the Spanish committed was not committed by whites, it was committed by Hispanics. Therefore, it's the Hispanic who have to uh, compensate the Native Americans for the genocide that they committed. That's very interesting. I mean, imagine every Mexican in the United States getting a a higher tax rate <laughs> for for the genocide. The Hispanic, the, the Hispanic committed genocide against the Incas. So it's the Mexicans who have to pay for the compensation against Native Americans, which is very confusing because the Mexicans themselves are native. And that's absurd. The, the idea of racial divisions, especially as found in the United States, is completely idiotic. And the idea that um, even Spanish people from Spain are not white, are Hispanic, is one of the most thoroughly delirious racial conceptions that I have ever seen in my study of racial conceptualizations. So this video was mostly about racial conceptions, because racial biological races Something that people didn't know. You may, may even see, say that it, it exists. It doesn't matter. We don't see it. We don't, we don't see people's genome. We don't see people's DNA when you look at them. Okay, We see people's phenotype. And then we judge them by that. And the idea that, um, you know, um, Antonio Banderas can be non-white, can be some kind of a minority, is profoundly idiotic. Just like saying that Elon Musk uh, is an African-American and deserves some affirmative action because, he is, of course, he is South African, right? So all, all Africans must be, must be black. 
just like the ancient Egyptian pharaohs must be black because they were in Africa, right? So they must be. So Elon Musk must be black. By the same token, Elon Musk must be a black man, just like Wesley Snipes and uh, Martin Luther King. He must be African American. So there were other absurdities, such as uh, the Finns, the people of Finland. Uh, in the United States, they were not considered white when they first came to the to, to, to the United States in the 1800s. Uh, it was only in a, a court case in 1908. There's a video on YouTube about it. Look for a uh, search for it. It's uh, when the Finns became white, something like that. Uh, the Finnish people were seen as Mongolic because they speak a, a language, as, you, uh, as some of you may know. The Finns speak a language that's not Scandinavian, it's not a Germanic language. They speak a Uralian language that is related to Asian languages, North Asian, from the Euro Mountains and the, the Siberian areas. So the, the Finns were seen as non, non-white, as yellow. They were yellow. They were like uh, Chinese people. <laughs> uh, which is, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> it's kind, it kind of makes some sense, of course. They are not properly the same thing as the Germanic Northern Europeans. But I don't know. I, I I can't I can't even actually I can't even comment about it. It's it's it, the idea the Finns Finnish people were not white. The other day I also saw that uh, with the European Union and all the migration. Uh, I saw I read that some over over ten years ago. It must have been around two thousand and eight or so, two thousand and ten. Uh, the Polish people were migrating in large amounts to the United Kingdom. That was before, of course, Brexit. Before the. the the UK left the European Union way before. And those Polish people were suffering uh, racism from the British. Now, that the, 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 they were suffering discrimination and racism? Uh, is there anybody who's whiter than the Polish people, more European looking? They are uh, the incarnation of especially Central Northern Europe, right? The, the, a, 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 anybody's idea of a white Caucasian European race must be the Polish people. That's more, more even, uh, about as much as the Germans. Um, and how, how can they suffer racism in Britain? Because the British are also white, a, a little bit less. British people tend to be a little bit darker skinned than uh, than uh, other Northern European peoples, uh, but only slightly. And how can the, the British be racist against Polish people? That's not racism. That's like a discrimination, but not racism, because they're not, we're not talking about different races. And there is also the issue of religion. Some people say that speaking ill, uh, criticizing Islam is racism. There was a famous um, episode of Bill Maher some 12, 15 years ago, I don't remember, when there, were, there was Bill Maher with Sam Harris. They were criticizing Islam, and Ben Affleck, the... Hollywood actor Ben Affleck was there and said, no, how, can, "How can you criticize Islam? That's racist." Uh, I don't know which is the, the idea that Islam is a race is itself profoundly racist, right? There's a a race of people who can't the the, the Muslims are racially different to the point that they can't choose their own religion. They were born with it, as if being black and being Muslim are the same thing. You know, it's uh, an inherent feature. So criticizing Islam is the same thing as criticizing blackness or criticizing uh, the, the facial features of uh, Asian people. It's um, it's a form of racism. So um, it's not racism. It may, be, it may, it may claim it as discrimination against uh, discrimination, that's prejudice, or that's something along those lines, but uh, not racism. The word racism is overused to, dis- to to describe any kind of discrimination. I understand that the spirit is the same, because discrimination is similar to racism, but let's use the right words for things a little. And of course, there are many other things that won't fit in this video. It's already over one hour long. I uh, could talk about... Um, to wrap up, I would like to talk a little bit about a little bit about Japanese anime. We talk about Japanese racial conceptions back in the imperial days of Japan, but today there's an interesting feature, that an interesting phenomenon of Japanese uh, manga 
cartoons, right? And the manga cartoons made by the Japanese are very un-Japanese like. Not only do they have gigantic eyes, which I won't even talk about it, but they have uh, facial features and hair hair colors and hair eye colors that are absent from Japan. Japanese are overwhelmingly universally black haired and brown eyed. And the, 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 the Japanese cartoons are often blonde and red haired and they have blue eyes. Uh, are the Japanese being self-racist or self-hating Japanese or by emulating uh, features that are not in Japan? Are they saying that they prefer Caucasian races with the colorful features found in many European races? Uh, so the Japanese, and one explanation that I said is the Japanese just uh, see themselves as a universal race as well. They don't see themselves as Japanese detached from Caucasians and other peoples. They just, uh, in pop culture, and that, that, it's also a way for Japanese cartoons to compete with Western productions in Japan by producing people and um, a diversity of, of, of physical appearances that Jap Japanese don't have. Japanese all look like Japanese, I'm sorry. Okay, that's, is that racist? But it's also true, right? Japanese are very, very similar to each other. Very, they look a lot, they look a lot, a lot like each other. There's very little genetic, phenotypical variation in Japan. Uh, so by producing cartoons with a, even when black, even some cartoons are even include black people. Uh, by by producing that, uh, a pop a pop culture media with a multiplicity of uh, physical appearances, they compete with Western productions. Where there's blonde people, brown-eyed people, black-haired people, black people, brown people, so they sort of uh, compete with that. So to me, that's the most that's the most convincing explanation than the idea that uh, Japanese are they, they see themselves as universal, they see themselves as uh, they, uh, they they imagine themselves as uh, people who can be blonde and can be can be red head That's a bit forced. I don't see. I, I don't think uh, the Japanese uh, the Japanese historically before my manga culture started in the late 20th century they depicted themselves as Japanese you see a Japanese art from the, the, the early 20th century from uh, centuries prior um, the Japanese they uh, portrayed themselves as East Asians exactly the way they are they didn't have to put on blue eyes and uh, some kind of blonde hair or put on a black character um, to make art then the art was great without uh, uh, resorting to uh, foreign races, foreign uh, appearances, and um, well, I think that's uh, pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I offered some kind of uh, enlightenment relative to uh, the idea of racial conceptions and how racism itself emerges from racial conceptions and phenotypical differences in humanity. Uh, if you have any questions or if you like to discuss with me, if you like to make another video with me where we can uh, make a live video or even a recorded video uh, discussing not only this issue of race and racial types, but um, linguistics and languages, which is the main focus on this channel, you can contact me through email, um, as, we, as you see in the description uh, of the video and you can also uh, contact me if you want to learn languages online I teach languages over whatsapp or telegram using a completely online interface I give you a content on a content page we're gonna work online on your content and we're gonna go, we can have uh, uh, phone calls uh, video calls to interact and uh, we can, you can contact me for more information okay so um, Leave your, uh, of course, uh, subscribe to the channel, leave your comment, leave your like if you, if you actually like the video. And um, I'll see you in the next video.